rolling. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the uh, Renton Chamber of Commerce Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Community Conversation Series. My name is Sean Greenlee. I'm a board member in the DEI liaison for the Chamber. I'm here in collaboration with your Chamber CEO, Diane Dobson. We're also co-sponsoring this with the Kent Chamber of Commerce and CEO, Zenobia Harris. I want to, as always, thank the City of Renton, Preeti Shadar, and Benita Horn for their partnership and ongoing support of this program. I also want to acknowledge Rock Project Management, Renton Technical College, and Dr. Linda Smith for their continuous engagement and support. Our goal here is to support our member organizations and community as we navigate this journey while learning ourselves. We seek to provide additional resources, community collaboration, and shared mentorship as we look to tackle these complex issues. We must work together and leverage each other's knowledge while acknowledging that many of us are operating under resource constraints. Creating an inclusive environment with improved employee and community engagement is critical to success, both in the workplace and for improved business results. Leading today's forum will once again be Benita Horn, inclusion equity consultant for the city of Renton. The focus of her consulting practice is organizational development through a social justice lens. Most of her clients are government entities and nonprofit organizations. Benita has also moderated many forums about race in the Seattle area. In this session, we will explore how to begin and engage in courageous conversations. What are courageous or critical conversations? We will learn from Dr. Stephanie Delaney and then have the opportunity to reflect on experiences and practice these skills. We want to encourage this session to be an open forum where you, the community, ask questions and share insights. We'll be monitoring the chat box for these. I ask though, we ask that please be respectful and constructive to the topic that we are discussing. Many of us are at different places on this journey, knowing how and where to start is a great first step. We're all in this together. And with that, Benita, I pass it over to you. Thank you, Sean, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, I, I'm just absolutely uh, delighted to uh, talk a little bit about our goal for this particular session. Um, and the focus tonight is courageous conversations. You know, what, uh, what you know, as Sean said, you know, we want to understand, uh, uh, you know, what we mean by them, how to engage in them. So often uh, in my work as a consultant, you know, people tell me, you know, I would love to talk to my group about this or other people about this, but I, about that, but I push the pause button because I'm not sure what to say. I'm not sure how to open it. You know, I'm not sure if even by introducing the topic, I'll offend someone. Uh, some people say that they feel like they're walking on eggshells if they try to talk about issues of, of, of race. And, you know, as we know, that's one of the most difficult conversations to be had in the United States uh, at any point in our history. And so uh, we have a, a, a wonderful uh, pre presenter uh, today uh, who has the knowledge and experience and expertise to take away uh, and remove um, the, some, hopefully, uh, the concerns that we have about entering into these conversations and also present, giving us some, some general ideas about how to do that. So with, um, I'm going to turn it back to Sean, who's going to introduce our guest speaker. And we really feel that each one of us will benefit today from having the opportunity to spread our wings and actually engage in a conversation with others in small breakout sessions. So this will be uh, learning and practicing. Sean? Yeah, well, thank you very much. And I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Stephanie Delaney, who's the Vice President of Instruction at Renton Technical College. Dr. Delaney has a strong background in guided pathways and e-learning and she's spoken nationally on issues related to leadership, technology, and effective online teaching and learning. Dr. Delaney earned her PhD in educational leadership in higher education distance education at the University of Nebraska at Lincoln. 
She also holds law degree from the University of San Diego School of Law and a master's degree in environmental law from Vermont Law School. On top of that, she earned her BS at Georgetown University. Humanizing, Stephanie is an avid knitter, birder, and rower. She lives in Seattle with her husband and son. Thank you very much for being here with us today, Stephanie. Thank you, Sean. Thanks for the lovely introduction. Thank you, Benita. Um, I'm looking forward to talking with you all today about crucial conversations around race. And um, we have a handout that I hope will get pushed out to you in just a few moments, because I'll use that as a way to sort of talk through um, some of the ways that you can engage in a crucial conversation. The structure that I'm going to be talking to you about is based on the best-selling book called Crucial Conversations. And it gives you, if you haven't had a chance to read the book, it gives you a, a structure for the skills that one can have to have those conversations that Benita was talking about. When you're just sort of uncomfortable, you don't have the conversations because you're not sure how it's gonna go and you're pretty sure that how it's gonna go is, is not well, um, especially when they're around touchy issues like race. Um, a crucial conversation is a conversation that is has sort of three components to it. The uh, topic is important, important to you, important to the other person. The emotions are high. You're, maybe there's some fear around it, some anger around it. Um, and then you're expecting that there's opposing views, that the person that you would be talking to about it may be coming at it from a different perspective than you do. Um, when you've got those three things, you've got yourself a crucial conversation. Um, I thought I would start, I would go through the, the structure of the model and then talk about a scenario and walk through it using, uh, using a scenario as a way to think through how to have a crucial conversation. So the five steps are that you would start with heart, start by thinking about yourself and why are you wanting to engage in this conversation. The second step is to master your stories um, and determine how it is that you're having that conversation. Oh, thank you. Um, then you want to state your path, which is an opportunity for you to uh, explain where you're coming at and to give the other person an opportunity to explain where they're coming from. Learning to look, make sure that when you're engaged in the conversation, you're keeping an eye out for how people are responding to that conversation. And then finally, making it safe. If people are reacting badly to engaging in the conversation, what can you do to make it safe for the conversation to continue? So those are the basic five steps for uh, crucial conversations. And, and there's, the, there's the book cover that you may have seen before. Um, I'll, I'll tell you, I went through training to be able to offer um, Crucial Conversations training, and the training itself is, is 10 hours long, and I'm not going to be able to give you a 10-hour training in the next uh, 15 minutes, so I'm really condensing these concepts, but the handout that I presented for you has some short little videos that are about a minute and a half each, two minutes, some of them. Um, that just sort of reinforce uh, and give some practical ways to think about these different steps. Um, but I'd encourage you, of course, to, to read the book or, or take a class um, if, uh, if you're feeling like the information that I'm about to present to you is, is helpful to you. So, start, so I'll start with an example of a racial incident that happened to me that might fall under the category of a microaggression. One of those small things that sort of when you look at it all by itself, you know, maybe isn't that impactful, but when it happens to you all the time, it starts to wear you down. I was in an interview situation and um, was just meeting the interviewee and we, you know, we shook hands and I held the door to my office open to let the person go by. And as they went by, the person said, oh, I really, I love your hair. And she reached out and she stroked it. Now, some people may not realize that it's really, really something that you don't do is touch somebody else's hair. 
without asking or touch somebody's hair at all, really. Um, chances are that many of you in the room have never had anybody reach out and attempt to stroke your hair before. But as a Black woman, this happens all too often where people reach out and think it's okay to just touch my hair as if I were a pet dog or something. Um, that is the type of, of, of story that I tell myself. Um, and it's just, it's, it's offensive. So the person didn't get the job. Um, and it's just not, not a thing that you wanna do. So if I'm going through my steps in crucial conversations, how might I apply these five steps to that situation? Um, and you can sort of think perhaps there's things that have happened to you or things that you have seen happen to other people or things that you see, conversations that you see generating. These, this, this set of skills could apply to any of those. So start with heart. Why would I wanna have a conversation with this person about that incident? Um, am I trying to prove a point? Maybe I wanna uh, prove some sort of point to the person like, man, you're a racist because you touched my hair. Um, that might be my motivation. Uh, am I trying to convince somebody to agree with me? Maybe I um, am wanting her to acknowledge that that, that was, um, an aggressive or, or, or a microaggression towards me. Uh, maybe I'm trying to understand a person's motivations. Why is it that they would do that and trying to come to some sort of shared understanding? Um, if I was going to have that conversation, my motive would probably be to prevent this person from losing other opportunities. As we went through the, uh, the interview, I think her heart was in the right place. She seemed like a nice person. I think that if she knew how I received that action, she would not have done it. Um, and so I'm pretty sure she didn't know. And so the, the start with heart for me would be, I would want to share that with her so that she would know and wouldn't, wouldn't do it again out of ignorance. Um, if you stay focused on good intent, that can help lower the temperature when you're engaged in the conversation because it's easy for, when you get in these conversations, it's easy to let your emotions uh, capture you and, and run with you. And um, if you can pull yourself back and just remember the reason that I'm having this conversation is because I, I wanna help this person, um, that I have this person's best interests in mind, it can, it can help to keep you cool so that the conversation can go well. The next step is to master your stories. And um, the high emotions that accompany these stressful conversations often come from the stories that we tell ourselves. So there's this, this four part uh, way that the emotions grow with relation to these conversations. First, we see or hear an action. Next, we tell ourselves a story related to that action. Then we generate some feelings about that. And finally, we act, we do something as a result of those feelings. So in this situation, I see, I, I experienced an action. She touched my hair. I told myself a story. She must not respect me because she's treating me like a dog. This is the story I'm telling myself. I generate a feeling about that story being told. Sadness, anger, disrespect. And then I act, I just struggle to stay neutral during that interview. So that's a pathway that we go through. We see an action, we tell ourselves a story, we have a feeling about it, and then we act. So if, we, if I think about that, I can sort of tease out, wait, what actually happened? What were the facts? versus how did I feel about those facts? Because those are two different things. And if you can separate those things apart, you can come into the conversation in a more neutral place. And that enables you to go into the next step, which is state your path. And when you state your path, you're giving, you're sharing with other people your facts and asking the other person to share theirs. So. 
if I was having the conversation with this person about hair touching, I might say, um, I would want to start by stating my facts. Um, hey, you just touched my hair with, without asking. And then you might just be very straightforward. The story that I tell myself when somebody does something like that is that you don't respect me because I think of, uh, of petting my hair in the same way that you might pet a dog as being disrespectful. But I'm relatively certain in an interview situation, you weren't trying to be disrespectful. So perhaps you could explain to me why it was that you did that or why it was that you felt it was okay to do that. So now I'm opening up just an invitation for her to share her facts, to share her perspective, to share her story. So when you share your facts and tease it out from the emotions, it allows you to, to come at it from a way that there was no way, if you're having a conversation where there could be some things that were disputed, the facts generally are things that can't be disputed. She touched my hair. What she meant by it could be disputed, but the touching couldn't be. So that's why it's nice to start with something neutral and then sharing, here's what I thought, because sometimes when you share the story, the facts of the story, the way they were thinking about it was completely different than the way that you're thinking about it. And without giving the opportunity to share your different stories, you don't know that and they don't know how you received it. When asking for the other person's path, um, you have to really listen. You don't want to listen with defensiveness, like, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to, oh, I, I have a, a counter to that point, or, oh, I'm, I'm going to say this when she stops talking. No, you have to, to listen truly to hear what the person's saying and look to get their genuine perspective, because the next step in the process is learning to look. And learning to look has you watching the other person for uh, two ways that people might react poorly to a crucial conversation. One is silence. They might just retreat into themselves. They might sulk. They might walk away. Just, you know, not continue to engage in the conversation. That's silence. The other way that people might respond is defensiveness. They might get angry. They might yell. They might just strike out in some way. They might, um, you know, do other things, threaten. Um, so those are two ways that people might react poorly to something, and you want to keep an eye out for that. You also want to keep an eye out for it in yourself. Are you retreating into silence or stopping talking or walking away and keeping an eye out for that reaction as well? Um, finally, if you do see someone retreating into silence or defensiveness, someone else or yourself, Work to make it safe. If um, Make it safe for people to be able to continue on with the conversation. And one way to do that is to clarify your intentions. Um, if you go into it with good intentions, state that. The reason I'm having this conversation with you about touching my hair is because I feel like you didn't realize how I would have interpreted that. You didn't realize that this was an offensive act and I wanted to wanted to make sure that you knew for the future activities. Um, and so stating this good intention, my intention is not to shame you. My intention is not to, um, to make you embarrassed. My intention is just to help you in future actions. So if you have good intentions, stating those really helps to smooth things out. If you don't, people tend to get defensive and also, if we don't state our intentions, people make things up because they, if they don't know why we're having this conversation, they think to themselves, they're telling their own stories in their head, just like we tell our stories about things. And usually the stories that people make up in the absence of other information are negative stories that cause the conversation to continue to go badly. So if you can state your intentions up front, um, you can help that conversation go better and can help to build trust. So those are the basic five steps of crucial conversations. And I know I just poured a bunch of information on you uh, in, a, 
an incredibly short period of time, uh, 10 hours of, of training in, in just over 10 minutes. Um, do you guys have some questions before we go into the breakout rooms and get a chance to dig into this a little bit? And I realize you might not until you come back after you've had a chance to uh, engage in, in some of these um, some of these exercises. But I will pause just in case people do. Benita, you're talking, but Definitely. you're muted. Oh, there you go. Yeah, I, I was just going to ask you about timing. Uh, that's a question that I often receive um, because people say, you know, if, if as, you know, as you were talking about um, you know, what, what are my re, uh, feelings about this? And sometimes those feelings are so deep that it seems to almost paralyze us at that instant. So is, um, is timing an issue? Might it be better to give ourselves some time and space, if possible, to start the conversation? Or what's been your experience? That's a great point, Benita. Sometimes you can have these conversations where you know the conversation is coming and you can plan it out. And actually as part of the crucial conversations training, you actually like write out a script of how the conversation might go, but that only works when you know the conversation is coming. Uh, but sometimes like in the, the situation with the hair touching, it just happens in a moment and you don't know that, you know, whether it's gonna continue on. And indeed in a lot of racial incidents, um, it might be something that you're just seeing on the street or seeing, you know, in a store or seeing in a situation that's sort of transient, but you feel like it's important to speak up and to maybe stop some action from happening or continuing. And you don't have the opportunity to, to think that through, but you can sort of think through incidents like that, if that makes sense, or debrief incidents. So often I have uh, had an experience, gone home and thought, man, I wish I had done <laughs> this other thing. Well, think through what that other thing is you would have done. How might you have responded to that differently? How might you apply these skills for that so that the next time something like that happens, even though it happens spontaneously, you've already sort of prepared how you might respond if it happens. So I agree that timing is an issue and, um, and preparing for either an imaginary situation or a situation that has already occurred can help for those ones more spontaneous things that, that might happen. Yeah, so as, we, as we wait for some other questions that may, may come up and again, you know, we'll have to time to process this and speak to reflection afterwards. Um, I do appreciate a lot of what you said and it kind of goes back to what we were talking about the other day, as well as I saw yesterday. And if you didn't did, have the opportunity to attend, attend the uh, Microsoft Include 2021 Day of Learning, um, one of the experts was talking about council culture versus cancel culture. And a lot of the premise behind that is just taking the time to kind of give grace to the audience and give him a chance to learn. Now, at the same time, I acknowledge that a lot of the emotional weight has been put on our BIPOC community to educate um, our allies. And at the same time, to a degree, um, provide them the resources, a lot of value in not publicly shaming them because acknowledging that it's better to keep those walls from going up instead of, instead of forcing them into that scenario where they withdraw and retreat. John, for those of us to um, whom those terms might be new, tell us a little bit more about cancel culture versus cancel culture. Well, cancel cancel culture is just it's a, it's a culture of shaming, shutting someone down um, if they say something wrong or racially insensitive or something that goes goes against um, just creating a warm and embracing, open, safe environment. Um, that's, that's where cancel culture occurs. And we see that a lot, you know, a lot just in social media and also just in, you know, conversation, day-to-day -day conversations. The concept of counsel is just that. Instead of cancel, it's just the opportunity of kind of taking and creating a learning environment. Thank you. 
It's about, it's about creating an opportunity for somebody to take a step back, reflect on what it is that they said and how it could have potentially offended another person. How, how the, the act of touching Dr. Delaney's hair is offensive and not welcome and embracing. So counseling them and giving them the opportunity to then, to then see it through a different light and through a different lens. And we did have a uh, question come up in the chat. What if the power dynamic of that story was with peers or with people who you report to in a work environment rather than someone you are interviewing? Sure, I think power dynamics are super important to consider. And that's a piece of the make it safe part. Um, if you are the superior talking to somebody below you, or if you're the person who's below talking to somebody who's above you, keeping in mind those dynamics can, um, can really relate to that safety piece and the clarification of intentions piece. So um, if you are talking with a peer and you're both on the same level, I think you could come at this from a, you know, I'm, I'm really trying to help you. And, and I think that stating of the intentions as part of the making it safe is especially important there. Um, or for people that you report to, that's a little more challenging. You're right, it's a little more delicate, but um, by the same token, not having those conversations leads to, can lead to such problems down the road that the risk that is, uh, the, the risk that you get from having the conversation um, may be outbalanced by, uh, by having the conversation. I, one of the stories that they share in the, the training is that in hospitals, when the, uh, when the hospital staff get to know each other, and it doesn't have to be like, you know, happy hour type of get to know each other. It's the mere act of introducing themselves around the operating table before they started an operation led to a marked reduction in fatalities. And this was because when they had introduced themselves to each other and felt like they at least knew who each other were, um, they felt more comfortable uh, expressing concern if something was going wrong. And, um, and that saved a lot of lives. So in, the, um, in those situations, clearly people who were uh, beneath the doctors, for example, maybe a nurse or, um, you know, some uh, surgical technician maybe didn't feel comfortable have, telling the doctor, hey, you're about to, you know, cut out the wrong thing. Um, but once they, they did the introductions, that may, lowered that barrier, made it a little bit safer. So uh, if, if you were trying to be polite or with, you know, trying not to have that crucial conversation because you feel like it might not be appropriate. Is it more appropriate for somebody to die or is it more important, appropriate to, you know, have that co crucial conversation? Now, in most of our situations, it's not like somebody is going to die, but um, it generally it's better to have the conversations and to get these things out. Um, and that, that if you do uh, cost benefit analysis, you, you'll find that it's worth it to have the conversation. And yes, Kim, you're exactly right. I mean, it's about, and that's kind of the component of uh, courageous. It is about being brave. Yeah. And it is about, yeah. you know, taking the, the necessary step to kind of say your, you know, say your truth. Um, and, and especially in organizations who constantly espouse, you know, feedback is a gift. We want to hear about it. You know, it's like, that's your opportunity to, to <laughs> not only challenge upwards, but to at least to take the opportunity to say, hey, I just wanted to share with you how this makes me feel. And potentially, if this, you were to have the same behavior towards the rest of my colleagues, it could have a negative effect on your effectiveness to get your message through and to continue with our engagement. Sean, that's a super great point. One of the other pieces of making it safe is, is going for shared, for mutual interest. 
Um, for example, at RTC, we are all about serving students. And so we might have two, I might have a conflicting point of view with somebody, but if I start the conversation off with, you know, we are here trying to serve students and, um, and I'm feeling like this thing that we're doing it isn't doing that. And, and here's the story I'm telling myself, what's the story you're telling so that, that shows that this is serving students. But since we both want to serve students, we can come together around that. Um, if your organization is trying to improve equity, starting off with, hey, I know that we're all trying to, to really support equity. Um, the story I'm telling myself is this is not an equitable action. I'm curious, you know, did you think this was an equitable action? How? I, I'm really curious to hear uh, how you thought it was moving our equity efforts forward. Um, and so that shared agreed area, if we all are trying to do this thing, was, you know, sharing that can make it easier to have those difficult conversations as well. Great. Well, Ashley, um, the logistics behind the scene, if you could start the process of breaking us out into the breakout room, then we can take these conversations to a smaller, more intimate setting. Okay. And so uh, what we're going to do um, in the breakout rooms um, is this. Um, Ashley's going to help set them up. Um, they're, um, e each breakout room, room, we've given you two possible topics to discuss in your breakout room. So as a group, that's your first uh, alignment of an agreed area is to decide which of those topics you want to discuss. Um, one, one of those um, will be more of a self-reflection. Um, when and where, excuse me, when and how did you first become aware that people are treated differently in our society? What did you experience and who helped you make sense of the experience? So that's one option. The other option is focused more on courageous feedback, um, just as, as uh, Kim mentioned in the chat box. So when you have observed words or actions targeted at an individual because of their identity, what did you do? What do you wish you had done? And so those, those are the topics. Uh, we're trying to keep the breakout room small and thankfully we have a number of people who have stepped up as volunteers to be um, breakout room moderators. And, and their role is simply to support the conversation to uh, ensure, as Sean said earlier, that the breakouts are a space where everyone is treated with dignity and respect, that the breakout rooms are a space where every single person in the breakout room gets the opportunity to share. Um, and uh, the moderators will be encouraging your participation uh, if, if they don't see that from everyone um, and to help clarify the discussion questions. We're going to ask each group, not the moderators of the group, but we're gonna ask each group to identify a volunteer uh, to, for a share back at the end. You know, what's one thing that stood out or came up there or you experienced in your application of having a crucial conversation? What's one thing that you learned? However you wanna frame that, just one thing. We'd like to hear one thing back from each group. So, um, you know, in advance, I want to thank our, our moderators. Um, Dr. Stephanie Delaney, was, it will be one of the moderators. Uh, Zenovia Harris, for those of you who were with us last time, you met Zenovia. She's the CEO of the Kent Chamber. Uh, Reverend Dr. Linda Smith, if you live anywhere around Renton, I'm sure you know who Dr. Smith is. Uh, Preeti Shridhar, Deputy Administrator, Public Affairs at um, City of Renton and very active in the community, and Sean Greenlee, uh, who has been our fearless leader and moderator and, and has a, um, a wealth of, of resources uh, in this area, uh, both as a practitioner and as, uh, as a manager in terms of making this all happen, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And then I will also be a moderator. So again, your moderator, we're, we're not there to, to police or be the word police or anything like that, just there in a supportive role and to make sure that the instructions are clear. So um, 
with that. Yep, and really fast, sorry to interrupt, Benita. I just want to remind everyone, um, our group session is recorded in this big discussion room. Uh, but when you go, and that's for future sharing so that we can upload this to YouTube and share with other businesses and nonprofits that were unable to make it to today's session. Um, but when you go into your breakout rooms, those are not recorded and those aren't recorded anywhere. So uh, those are completely safe spaces. And so I just wanted to reiterate that in case um, anyone was unaware how Zoom uh, worked and operated. I just wanted to throw that out there before we go into our breakout rooms. Awesome. Thank you, Ashley. Thank you, Ashley. That's such an important aspect of this. So we're ready and we're going to have it from now um, until um, uh, 4.55, right? In our breakout yeah. sessions. Okay. Yeah, we'll probably allow for 20 minutes. Yes.
All right, it looks like we're gonna be trickling back into here. Okay, looks like we're all back, right? And so, uh, Stephanie, uh, you and I uh, get to um, ask for the next act of courage, which is the people who volunteered in each of the breakouts to do a share back. You can know, share back. Share <laughs> Hi, everybody. Yeah. My name is Camila, and I am a Renton citizen or resident, and I also work for King County Public Health. And I joined these conversations because I think they are very, very necessary. And I real, I'm really thankful that these are happening. So in my group, um, we shared a few personal stories. I don't want to go to a lot of detail. I'm trying to be brief so everybody can share. And one of the things that came out was, uh, you have heard that uh, statement, what doesn't kill you, make you stronger. For persons of color, I don't think that's the real thing. Sometimes we are so tired of hearing something about our culture, of hearing about microaggressions or hearing a word of racism that Sometimes I just come home and I shut down and, and feel really bad. I mean, it's important to, to mention that the damage that those comments make to other people are, are huge because it's like, as, my, as one of my friends say, it's like a mosquito bite. If you get one, you get scratchy, but if you get 10 mosquito bites, you're going to be super uncomfortable. And also we mentioned that sometimes we don't speak up because we are afraid of retaliation, especially at work. And at least two of the persons that shared in our group said that. So it's important to maybe to stop the person, to tell the person, whoever is doing a microaggression, to stop it. But at the same time, we don't know if we are going to have a retaliation after that. And uh, so another, another thing is that when we share about these um, series of discriminations, I personally was, my, my probation period was extended for three more months because I don't speak good English. And I was hired as a Spanish speaker doing outreach for public health. And that hit me hard. Um, I mean, I, I suffered a lot of trauma. I still have that trauma. So if you hurt somebody, it's not necessarily, it's not only good to say, I'm sorry. It's trying to find a way to, to fix that relationship. Because for me, it's like a lot of scars that we have when, when people hurt us. And, and it's, really, it's really hard. So I'm, I'm glad that we are having these conversations. I can go, go ahead. ahead. Yeah, go, go ahead. ahead. Hi, everybody. Um, I just want to say thank you to everybody for putting this together and for those moderating the groups. I've, I've found it very um, helpful, even though I think it was pretty nerve wracking. <laughs> um, but one of the things that we mentioned in our group was uh, this understanding of, of like a personal reconciliation of this moment in which you realize that you have 
in some sense, either been a passive bystander to others suffering or, or there's been some event in your life that's called you forth to say, you know what, I don't, I don't want to stand back in the way that I have anymore and that I want to show up for people of color and I want to do the work. Um, and so that can come at any age from any experience in a variety of different ways, but um, just this collective recognition that we're ready to do that work. And so I, I found that pretty inspiring. And the second piece was we had a couple of um, ESL teachers in our group who mentioned you know, when you're speaking with a, a foreign language student who maybe isn't understanding you, and so you, let's say you slow down your speech and you try and get more clear, um, but you don't want to come across that you're dumbing it down or that you're making them feel like they don't understand or maybe that they're dumb, um, which is so not the case, but, you know, you're afraid of how you're being perceived. And one of the things that we talked about was that intention and that tone that you carry. You can slow down your words and, and speak in very clipped sentences and still be coming from the heart and with good intention. Um, but I guess one of the questions that it, it brought up in me, uh, since we, we talked about bringing questions to this in the end here, is at what point um, is there that difference between, you know, it, I might feel I'm having the best of intentions but I'm still going to have blind spots because I'm a human being. So where do you reconcile that, you know, feeling of, but all my intentions were good, but I still missed a cue or I still, my, the way I said something still landed for someone different than how I intended. And so for me, that's another place of where that work needs to begin of doesn't matter. You know, I might feel that my heart's in the right place, but you know, I still need to examine all of my biases or the way that my messaging is coming across. So I just really appreciated the groups um, looking at those kind of more nuanced things. So, thanks. Thanks, Tanya. Thank you, Tanya. Oh, thank you. I didn't want to interrupt you, but I did want to also acknowledge and thank Camila because it does take courage to speak out uh, in groups like this. Stephanie, there was a question there, and I'm gonna I'm going to pass that to you. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, the question about what if you've got the best of intentions and 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 you misstep and um, or that you're worried that you will misstep. Uh, one of the videos that uh, I share in the handout, and I'm gonna forget which one, but um, but one of them attack uh, addresses this very issue. Um, and the best thing to do is to say that it, when you're stating your path, say you know I've. I've got the best of intentions, but I realize I might misstep, and I hope that um, that you'll be my partner in this conversation and, and let me know. I'm 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 trying to learn. I'm willing to hear, you know, whatever feedback you've got for me, um, and just stating your good intentions as opposed to just assuming good intentions is just super important, especially when you misstep. Um, and, you know, giving the opening for people to say, and then actually being able to receive that. So if somebody says, well, actually, what you just did really was offensive to me. And I think the natural thing is for your barriers to come up and freeze up, but I'm not a racist, or I didn't mean it, or I, really, I, that wasn't my intention. You know, but if you put yourself out there and said, I want to learn, you got to be able to learn. And, and it's okay to even say that, wow, I didn't realize it was hitting you that way. And I got to sit with that for a minute. I, can, I, can I think about this for a little bit and come back and have some more conversation with you about it after I've had a chance to absorb it? Um, and, and that's okay too. So I think I'm going to be Thanks. next, Benita, if that's okay. Yes, absolutely. It's gonna be very hard to follow Tanya and Camila, but just for a full disclosure and show how small this world is, <laughs> I'm gonna share that Camila and I went to college together in Mexico City, and we didn't find until three years ago that we were, were living in Renton. So <laughs> yeah, that's a very small world. So I, I'm very happy that both of us find each other here because we can share a lot of this experience together and, and understand each other what we have gone through as an immigrant. Um, so our group uh, uh, decided to respond to the first answer, the first question, which was, uh, 
uh, when we realized that people were treated different. And we have a, we have a lot of things that we, we, we share that they're very interesting because all the per people that were in my group, all of us, we come from a very diverse geographical areas in United States. And obviously I am all from Mexico. So one of the common themes was that in, their, in our early childhood, we didn't recognize that people were different than us. But when we start noticing that something happened, we ask our parents why, why this or why that and uh, our parents didn't know how to help us or answer these questions. Mm -hmm. And uh, most, uh, we believe that it because it was uh, at the time an uncomfortable com conversations. But when we really recognized that that there was people that were treated, treated different was for personal experiences that we have had in our adult, early adult life and through our lives in general. So we talk a lot about diversity in general. Um, and how uh, if you are different, uh, you have to cope with people that will eventually uh, reject you or someone else. The good news about all of this is that even though we didn't learn from our parents how to also teach our children uh, or answer the questions to our children, the new generations are very savvy and that they are very well educated. And also as a new, gener as a new adult generation, now they are all these conversations in the last five years that are helping us a lot and using tools. So we have high hopes that the new generations will be the real change uh, of, 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 in the future for this. So thank you everybody for sharing. Thank you, Ruth. I can go next if no one else wants to. Uh, so our group had a similar conversation, it sounds like to uh, Ruth's group. Uh, we talked a lot about our childhood and how we grew up. And um, I think one of the things that kind of stood out for us was uh, we did the first question and the experiences and the time frame of when we realized that was so varied that it really stood out how um, each of us really is on our own journey in uh, learning and um, you know, we all have different experiences that make who we are. And I think that that was kind of the main thing that we all got out of it. Thanks, Sarah. We'll go next for our group. Uh, and it's similar to what Sarah um, also said that our group, we um, can represent it at all four corners or of the United States, which was really fun. And um, while some of us realized at a, a younger age um, that folks were treated differently, um, a couple of us are learned at an older age based on something that was said by um, a loved one and others are going through that now. So it's not something that just happened, you know, at a young age, it's, uh, it's, it's a constant, it's, um, it, yeah, it's, it's just that we're all growing and changing and that while, um, we're always evolving and we can see how people are treated differently. Tomorrow, it might be something different again. So, um, and then just going back to what Stephanie had said, um, that we need to really take the time to step back and, and, and listen, understand, um, and have that conversation when we do realize that someone is being treated differently. So, sorry, I'm not very good at articulating. <laughs> you did a great job, thank That's you. That's great, thanks Jamie. Right. So, um, I guess I agree with, we're kind of all on this journey. And one thing that kind of, when our group was talking, um, Arlie was mentioning that he stood up and didn't say words. And I thought as many of us were afraid to speak sometimes because we don't know what to say, but we can do nonverbal things. 
like just going to stand next to someone or um, a look or just being near or between if that's what happens too sometimes um, that there's many ways to do it and we've all had the experiences of when we have done what we and we haven't and examining those and and trusting that we have the best intentions and growing like you say that's what we're doing and um yeah it's it's been it's a journey no matter what our age thank you leslie um, I'm going to have to take off uh, for another meeting, so I'm going to turn it back to uh, Sean. I think, have we heard from all the groups? I thought we so, had, but maybe not. Do we have one more group to hear from? I, okay, yeah. so I'm going to... So I'm going to turn it back to uh, Stephanie and, and Sean, who will make sure that everyone had a chance to share. And then Sean, you're going to tell us um, what the, what, what's next in yeah. the series of community conversations. So good evening, everyone. And thank you for, I learned a lot tonight and I value and appreciate that uh, from, uh, from Stephanie, from the, the breakout group that I was in. So, um, you know, we, we're all on this journey, as someone said, and we can learn from each other. Thank you. Thank you, Benita. Thank you, Preeti. Yeah, thank you, Preeti. Thank you, Benita. As always, your insights are just invaluable and will allow you to go off and continue to in positively impact and change the world. <laughs> thank um, you. We'll wrap the rest of this up in a bow. And, and at this time, I'm going to thank you guys all for sharing. That's, uh, you know, it takes a lot of courage and takes a lot of vulnerability. And I think as we acknowledge, there is no one set cookie cutter model to this. Um, I would like to give um, Dr. Delaney an opportunity to tie up any of these themes up and in nicely into a bow. Um, sure. <coughs> Just the one thing that I would, would share with you is that I think one of the things I love about the Crucial Conversations model is that it's a skill that anybody can learn. And it, it's so easy to be frightened by the idea of having these conversations. And it doesn't necessarily need to be a crucial conversation about race. It might be a crucial conversation with my husband about how he loads the dishwasher. You know, there's all <laughs> sorts of these conversations that you can have. And this is a set of skills that you can apply in any of those situations to feel less stressed. And I mean, it's never gonna be easy, but at least you know it will be more successful because you've got the set of skills and the steps that you can move through. And when you start to apply it and see how it works, it just um, is it's super empowering. Um, so I encourage you all to, to give it a shot and, um, and realize that you can have these conversations and you can have them skillfully. Yeah, no, that's, that's exactly it. And thank you again for, for validating that. And I would just encourage everyone, I mean, not to be, it's, it's easier said than done, but not to be hesitant to have these dialects and conversations. And even if you like take a peer, take a mentor, take a, you know, take a, you know, phone a friend to have these talks. We don't necessarily have to wait for these once a month big gatherings in which we talk it as a larger group, but you can have these kind of like talk through how would you address a situation with anyone on this group? Because we, we started this whole forum to kind of build a community of support and we're going to learn through other people's experience. So I would encourage you to reach out to, I mean, I'll just say it, you know, reach out to anyone on this call, on the Zoom call and uh, ask for someone's experience, um, whether it be a small group or a, or a larger group because that's where we're just gonna start getting comfortable, more comfortable with it. And we also learn a lot more and become more comfortable when we learn through other people's experiences. Uh, that's, where, that's where a lot of the, the continual education and, and you know, whether, whether you're at an early age or a later stage in life, there's always gonna be something that's gonna come up and is going to reveal your blind spots that you have because ain't nobody perfect. So, um, that's, that's what I would just like to leave. So um, as we go forward, um, thank you guys for joining this. There are, we will push out 
these resources, whether, whether you have the resources of the handout and the videos um, that, that Stephanie provided to us, or a lot of the resources that were pushed out, and I think it was the, uh, the email that came out on the 9th of March from the chamber announcing this, and there were a lot of good resources and books. And, and again, it's like, yeah, I'm not gonna sit and read every single book that comes across because there's so many resources out there. I'm not gonna, I'm more of like a quick two minute video. That's what kind of floats my boat and resonates as my learning style. But that being said, there's a lot out there for you to be able to kind of draw upon whatever fits your needs. And I'd encourage you to continue to do that and keep the conversation, conversation going. The next one um, in April, probably around the third, the third week of April, we'll confirm what, what's you know, the best date for everyone. We'll be addressing the topic of implicit bias and we'll kind of spin off from there. So that's gonna be the next topic. And then the following one down the road, um, which was asked for is that how do you create or how do you lead your own organizational self-assessment as to where your organization is at in this journey and potentially what are some of the tactics that you can build into your routines to be able to lead your organization in a certain way or change a culture in a certain way. So that I think, um, with, with that being said, we appreciate if there's anything else, Diane, you know, I appreciate your continued support and allowing us to create this space. Um, and then Zenobia coming active as a partner for the Kent Chamber of Commerce. And similarly, we're going to make this a regional approach because power in number is huge and, and growing and learning together and building our network of support and success will be critical for us going forward. 529, I think we hit our timelines. If there's anything else, please feel free to drop it into chat or reach out to me or Diane or I'll throw it out Zenobia directly and uh, we'll help to facilitate our journey going forward. As always, amazing taking this time with you guys and thank you guys for sharing. Thank you. Thanks everybody. Thank you.